Welcome to the Angus Report. I'm your host, Clint Mefford, and we're bringing you the latest cattle news and education. This week, we visit with the Director of Education for the American Royal. Foreign investment in U.S. farmland is on the rise. We talk about the benefit of using custom-made vaccines, and we head to Angus County, Scotland to visit Dunluise Angus. This is the Angus Report. The American Royal serves as an incredible learning event for young people across the country. While a majority of the youth who benefit from this experience are involved in agriculture, Christy Larson, the Director of Education for the American Royal, explains how the event is targeting more untraditional students. The mission of the American Royal, and really what we base everything on, is impacting the future of agriculture. And we do that three different ways, through our competitive learning, through our education programs, and through scholarships. A lot of people can understand the competitive learning. That's the livestock shows and the judging contests, the horse shows, the rodeos. Even our World Series of Barbecue is our largest competitive event. Education programs and scholarships is where I put my focus. Uh, education not only for the traditional agricultural student, the 4-H and FFA member, but also those known non-traditional students here in the Kansas City metro area that don't know where their food comes from. You know, I'll speak mostly to our newest initiatives on the middle school level. In middle school, when you're 13, 14, 15, um, you don't know what you don't know. What's been the most interesting is also the teacher perspective too. Um, it's not that they have a bad impression of agriculture, it's that they have no impression of agriculture. So how can we be the ones to talk to them about what our industry looks like, what that looks like in technology, in food production, in research and development and sustainability, things that students as middle schoolers are really interested in, but they don't think that they fit into this industry because they're not from a production background. So again, um, our middle school teachers especially are very hungry for the information and um, have been wonderful partners for us. I am so excited about a new facility because, again, students and teachers are hungry for the information to have an epicenter of learning where they can come and, and do research or um, have debates or tour and see live animals and meet people that peer-to-peer -peer learning. When we have our livestock show and kids are learning from kids their age that show livestock, that is so incredible. That, that just can't be duplicated. Opportunities like that in our new facility are going to be incredible. It's going to make my job a lot more fun and interesting, and it already is fun and interesting. Visit AmericanRoyal.com for more information about the American Royal Stock Show. Stay tuned. We'll be back with more Angus Report after a break. Welcome back to the Angus Report. In 2016 alone, foreign investors acquired 1.6 million acres of U.S. agricultural land, the largest increase in more than a decade. Data from the USDA shows that foreign investors currently control at least 28.3 million acres. Those acres are valued at around $52.2 billion and is roughly the size of Ohio. The state with the most foreign ownership is Maine, which has 3.1 million acres controlled by foreign entities, followed closely by Texas at 3 million acres. Other states with significant foreign controlled acres include Alabama, Washington, and Michigan. Foreign ownership makes up about 2.2% of farmland and 1% of all land in the U.S. Canadian individuals and entities currently own the most U.S. land at 4.7 million acres, followed by the Netherlands at 4.5 million acres. Both of those countries are heavily invested in U.S. forest land. The increasing amount of foreign investment in agricultural land has spurred efforts to limit foreign acquisition of farmland. Six states already have legislation banning foreign ownership. Those states are Hawaii, Iowa, Minnesota, Mississippi, North Dakota, and Oklahoma. Advocates for this type of legislation argue that U.S. ownership provides better stewardship of land and is better for rural communities. Visit fsa.usda.gov to view the Foreign Holdings of U.S. Agricultural Land report. 
President Donald Trump recently announced the enactment of a $19.1 billion disaster bill to help those affected by recent catastrophic storms. Three billion of that is intended for agricultural relief, specifically crops prevented from planting in 2019 and stored grain lost to flooding. Additionally, the disaster package covers previous year's hurricane damage in the south, wildfires in the west, and volcanic eruptions in Hawaii. $600 million for food stamps in Puerto Rico is also included. According to economist John Newton at the American Farm Bureau Federation, agricultural aid could be spread pretty thin because of the wide array of natural disasters across the country. Visit docs.house.gov to view the bill. We check in now on the latest cattle market news with the Cattle Facts Update. Hello and welcome to the Cattle Facts Update. I'm Tanner A. Harrod. Through April, young broiler ready to cook production is up almost 1% compared to 2018. Surprisingly, production the first three months of the year was actually slightly below a year ago. This was due to lighter than expected bird weights. In fact, April was the first month in 2019 with a year-over-year -year increase in weights. Record broiler production is expected in 2019, and the odds favor it will also happen next year. A major factor Supporting this is the additional processing capacity that has recently come online and is projected through mid-2020. Six new or refurbished facilities are expected to be opened by the end of 2019 and another by early 2020. But it is important to note that it could take several weeks or months after the opening date until the plants are running at full speed. The extra capacity should create the largest increase in production during the fourth quarter of 2019 and through the first half of next year. Assuming the three plants with the earliest open dates are ramped up to peak performance by the fourth quarter, this would equal roughly 2% more capacity, further supporting the larger year-over-year -year increases later in the year. By mid-2020, the industry should have the ability to grow production 6 to 7% compared to 2018. Broiler egg set will be the first variable indicating an increase in production. Over the last several weeks, egg sets have been running just 1 to 1.5% 1 above a year ago, but will need to be monitored closely going forward, as a significant jump would support future production growth. With more supplies expected on the market, additional global outlets will be critical. However, through April, broiler exports are down 26 million pounds, or 1% compared to last year. Cattlefax projects exports to rebound, especially in the fourth quarter, and end the year up almost 1% versus 2018. For the Angus Report and Cattle Facts, I'm Tanner Ahern. To learn more about Cattle Facts, your leading source for beef industry market information, visit cattlefacts.com. Next on the Angus Report, we discuss custom-made vaccines. Stay with us. Welcome back. Commercial vaccines generally are effective means to protect against diseases plaguing the cattle industry. However, when that efficacy seems to decline due to new or unusual strains of pathogens, a custom vaccine could be the answer to providing a better, more specific immune response. Randy Sherbrun, director of the Ruminant Business Unit at Newport Laboratories, explains when a custom vaccine might need to be considered. Typically, the custom-made vaccines that we can provide are used when the existing commercial vaccines or the off-the-shelf vaccines don't seem to be covering the problem. Um, and it may be due to strain variation within uh, the same species or different species of pathogens that are causing a problem. The process would start for the producer by recognizing that he or she had some issues and their cattle, some uh, disease problems that weren't being addressed by their current preventive health program. And so what we would recommend at that point uh, is them working with their local veterinarian and, and having some follow-up done on that that may involve the veterinarian coming out to the uh, premises, looking the situation over, and doing uh, maybe some diagnostic work uh, that would be appropriate. If there were any uh, uh, deceased cattle involved, they could do post-mortem necropsies on those cattle or take samples on living cattle if that was appropriate too. Sherbrun outlines the steps of Newport Laboratories' custom-made vaccine manufacturing process 
including sampling, diagnostics, and post-administration follow-up. The process for making an autogenous or a custom-made vaccine really begins with what we isolate or grow from doing the diagnostics, whether it's a bacteria, a mycoplasma, or a virus, or in some situations, a combination of two or more of those things. And then after discussing the situation uh, with the, cons the attending veterinarian, our tech service veterinarians would then uh, develop a formulation for how we would make a product from those organisms, how we would adjuvant it, in other words, what um, chemical we would put in it to stimulate a good immune response, and then that organism would be sent over to our production facility. It's a USDA licensed manufacturing facility, and then we start growing the organism up depending on the number of doses that are requested by the veterinarian. And then the production process continues by scaling up that, the growth of those organisms. Once we get them to where we want them to be in terms of what we call the harvest criteria, the number of uh, particles that we want in the product, the amount of antigen, um, then we inactivate it, and then it's mixed with an adjuvant, and then it goes through a bunch of USDA-required quality control testing to assure that it's a safe and, and sterile product. Sherbrun provides examples of several common cattle pathogens that custom-made vaccines are currently being used to prevent, as well as the cost-effectiveness of the commercial versus autogenous options. Among the diseases that can be addressed with autogenous or custom-made vaccines, uh, a big one is pink eye. Uh, we see pink eye problems across the country in cow-calf operations, stalker operations, um, and, and even in uh, feedlot situations. That's a big one. But also some respiratory situations where uh, we're seeing pneumonia or shipping fever that may be caused by bugs or pathogens that aren't in the commercial vaccines. And a couple examples of those would be Mycoplasma bovis, um, Bibersteinia trehalosi, and Histophila somni. We also can help address some enteric problems that cause scours in baby calves, uh, for example, like rotavirus. People often ask about the cost of these things and how they compare to the off-the-shelf commercial vaccines. And as opposed to what one might intuitively think about a custom-made product, like custom-made boots or a saddle or a hat, um, typically the price is no greater than that of a commercial uh, off-the-shelf vaccine, and sometimes is, is less. Up next, we visit Dunluis Angus in Angus County, Scotland. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Angus Report. The cattle genetics field is stronger now than it's ever been. Genomic advancements have made tremendous progress in the last decade, facilitating selection for increased cattle performance and ultimately a superior breed. However, halfway across the world in Angus County, Scotland, Jordy and Julia Souter are bringing back the basics of the breed. I think a lot of people have forgotten that the Angus cattle are named after the actual county. And we live in the centre of this county. I'm a native of Angus, as these cattle are. And when we started, there was less than 150 native Angus breeding females left in the world. A few years later, they would have been gone, and you can never get them back. It was a testimony to our forebearers. They made these cattle and brought the world teeming here. The founding father of the Angus breed is recognised as Hugh Watson of Keeler Farm. They began to diligently record the breeding patterns of the cattle. Initially, they would be handwritten in big ledgers. By the mid-1800s, they compiled the hair book. And thereafter, every year, a hair book was published with any registered animals bought in that year. The cow families that are now well known around the world. Eight of them started here in the county of Angus. 
Behind us here are the glens of Angus. This is the range of the hills, uh, the foothills of the Grampians. Some very austere countryside, but that's where a lot of these Angus cattle originated. In Scotland we have over 11,000 tartans and they're usually affiliated with family names. So we came up with the idea that we would create the Dunluise tartan. We made it more about the county of Angus. So we have white to represent the snow-covered Grampian Mountains and it runs down to the blue of the North Sea. On the sides of the hills we have the purple coloured heather. We then have lush green grass and it is famous for the soft fruit growing, so things like strawberries, raspberries. So we have this, what I'm calling a raspberry colour. This farm would be put together the same time as the first Herdwick principally. It constitutes 135 acres, fairly small fields divided by stone fences or stone walls which have been there for 200 years. These stone buildings with blue slate roofs, they come from the time of horses and carts and a multitude of staff with wheelbarrows. Because our farm is not large, we have no four-wheelers, no horses, we handle our cattle on foot. And we have the Dunluise herd. That's my husband, Geordie, and myself. And we have two children, Duncan and Louise. Hence the name Dunluise for our prefix, for our herd name. There are only chiefs in this family. And so we have this rule where inside the garden walls, I'm in charge. And outside the garden walls, Geordie is in charge. How would I describe Geordie? Okay, I have a, a phrase that um, we're all going to be a long time dead. And so while we're here, everybody should be passionate about somebody and about something. We bought this farm in 1990. And after a few years of commercial cattle, we decided that we were going to breed Pedigree Aberdeen Angus. And when he went to sales and looked at the current Angus cattle, he started to hunt for the shorter leg, deeper bodied, uh, triangular faced cattle that he remembered from his youth. And that led on to specialising in the original native genetics. It didn't start out as a, a, a mission, but it very quickly became that. I'm a native of Angus, as these cattle are, and when we started this, there was less than 150 native Angus breeding females left in the world. So it was on their critically endangered list, which is the you know, highest category of all. A few years later, they would have been gone and you can never get them back. We set out to collect the remaining cow families that were left in existence. In some cases, there were only two left. So we had to start with what was there. We knew fairly quickly that we had the potential of quite a unique product. And it was just at, really at the start of families getting home computers. Could we somehow use this computer that had arrived in a TNT box and I'd assembled and with a, on a wing and a prayer? There, there were no corner shops that you could walk into and get someone to write a website for you. And um, I actually just did an A4 page and that was the way we let everybody know what a great product that Geordie had. It was very much walking into the wind. Other people saw it in the early stages as a little bit of a joke. The perception, the genetics, 
there were a few holes in the road, there is no question. But as time went on, people then came back. Once they'd used these animals, they could see the virtues that they had. The momentum was sort of underway and it just kept increasing. Wouldn't it be neat, as he put it, to have a native Angus sale in the middle of the county of Angus, where it all began, and we've had plenty of time to think and plan. But of course, it's not usual in this country to do on-farm sales. In fact, it's unheard of. I wanted to do it on-farm, and believe you me, there have been several times I wondered the wisdom of that. I'm also a native of this county. I was born here, in this county, and I wanted to do this back here and say we overlook these magnificent hills, and uh, it was important to me. So it meant starting from scratch, building a sail ring, building a rostrum, um, bringing in the tiered standing. Every single detail he has picked through. It seemed to catch the imagination of friends and family from the very beginning. And because of the network we have here, it's all people we know that pitched in to make this day I'm just so pleased that the day went well for him. You stick your head above the parapet, you're doing something a little different. There was an awful lot going on that day. It was so heartening to see people from different parts of the world come across, hold out their hand and address you by your name. And you think, hey, we're just a wee farm in the county of Angus. I'm not sure what um, path my life would have taken had Geordie not started to collect up these native Angus. It has been a truly, truly magnificent journey. It really has. I, I find it just absolutely amazing the people that come and have embraced what we are doing and the ethos of what we are doing, which is exactly what our forebearers did many years ago. And of course now these cattle, these native cattle, are scattered all around the world, so they are no longer endangered. Well, it's great that Dunlouise Angus is keeping the history of the breed alive. And that's a wrap for this week's Angus Report. Tune in next week for industry-leading news and education. And as always, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Angus TV, for more highlights from the association. We'll see you soon.